Jeff, very nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. Hey, Sean. Good to see you. Likewise. So, um, first of all, I can't miss the picture that you've got in the background of Satoshi Nakamoto. So, oh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> where did they come yeah, from? Um, so, this is uh, uh, by a Scottish artist called Trevor Jones, who is uh, kind of well known in the crypto space. He's done a few done a few things. This was a little bit before the NFT boom. And I think now he's been selling NFTs. Um, and so, yeah, Satoshi sits prominently on my wall. And, uh, you know, it's great because obvious for, because it, it is a real Satoshi Nakamoto, but it's obviously not Satoshi. And uh, so I, I just happened to like this. So I got a print. It looks pretty amazing. And What's also interesting is the background is obviously from the Financial Times, I think, which is the uh, the heading of the uh, the message in the Genesis blog. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So it's from uh, yeah, so it's from that issue, uh, which is pretty hard to get a hold of these days. If if you've ever tried to, all the Bitcoiners have scooped them up. Um, but yeah, it's from that infamous Genesis block message, um, and there's some of the other articles uh, as well. And you get, you can actually uh, it, it is a print, but he used the real newsprint to do it. And uh, so you can actually read them if you get up close. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So first of all, um, I'd love to hear an introduction about yourself in terms of your background and what you do. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I guess it, it could be a bit, bit varied depending on who I'm talking to, um, but um, I, I'm an engineer. I went to school for engineering. This is a... a real life engineering or mechanical engineering as opposed to uh, software engineering these days when you hear the term engineer. Um, and uh, after I graduated school, I sort of went traveling, landed in New Zealand and uh, happened upon a teaching job at the university uh, as sort of an interim short term thing. Uh, but that was many years ago. And so, so now I'm a lecturer at the, at the uni. And uh, I started teaching math and physics. Um, and in the last few years, I've actually transitioned a bit. And so I still teach those topics, uh, but I also teach cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, at, at the university. And uh, that, that all spun out of when I found Bitcoin. Um, and that was about, uh, going back a ways now, is about, it, it started in 2014, and uh, so if you're familiar with the timeline, you know what was going on. Uh, there was a lot of media after, I guess, the bull run in, in late 2013, and uh, so I, I, I missed all that. I didn't have any clue, but uh, uh, I saw an article on Facebook, of all places, and uh, that got me interested, and I was quite curious uh, about it. I thought it was a good idea, um, but I didn't have any money. And uh, I remember looking up the price of Bitcoin and it was about $800. Is and that I, the, that's the bull run back then that we call it, right? 800. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is all retrospective because I wasn't, I wasn't there feeling it at the time, but um, co contrasting that with how much money I had, I had about $800. And uh, I thought, well, there's, there's no way. Uh, I had a unit bias at the time and, uh, uh, so I, I put it put it aside and uh, didn't come back to it for a few years, and then in 2017, uh, I, I was working at the uni. I was teaching teaching math and physics, and I started reading about sort of the modern day uh, cypherpunks. Uh, so I was quite interested in Edward Snowden and uh, what he was up to, uh, and at the same time, the hacker group Anonymous. Uh, was also making headlines and uh, also that all ties in with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So I just started reading uh, some nonfiction books. Glenn, Glenn Greenwald wrote uh, a great one called No Place to Hide about Edward Snowden uh, and then Hollywood also made a, a good movie about it. Um, and so that sort of uh, reminded me about Bitcoin and I, I remember very clearly uh, after work one day I was like well let's go check on the price of Bitcoin, see what it's up to. And uh, so I found my way to coin market cap for the very first time. And, you know, regardless of the price, I was blown away because there was this whole listing of coins. And I, I, I was like, holy shit, 
I had some catching up to do. Um, I looked at number two, which was Ethereum, and I'd never heard of it. Uh, and obviously, number one was and still is still is Bitcoin, and and I that that's really what started it um, uh, and started my my crypto journey. And yeah, so I've sort of rearchitected everything about my uh, professional life to make sure it involves blockchain in some way, some form. Wow, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned a couple of things there. First of all, unit bias. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what, what does the, that mean? The, the unit bias. So the, the unit bias says that when you see the price of something as, uh, of a single unit, so if I see the price of a single Bitcoin today at like uh, 48,000 US dollars, um, you might be tricked into thinking that you need that much in order to purchase one, uh, which is true, but uh, you don't need to purchase a, a whole one. So one of the benefits of all of uh, these cryptocurrencies, you know, using digital networks is that you can uh, sort of have many, many subdivisions. Uh, and, and that's one of the good features um, you know, about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is how many decimal places you have. Uh, and, and you see it, you kind of see it in the media from time to time it comes up or when you introduce new people to it, they say, oh, that's expensive. I can't buy one. And, you, and then immediately you have to say, well, no, um, you, you can buy less than one. Um, it used to be that you had to buy a whole stock as well, one single share, and you couldn't subdivide that. So for example, if you wanted to buy Berkshire Hathaway, which is one of the most expensive single, single shares. Uh, you know, you had to be quite a wealthy individual. Um, of course, with modern infrastructure, now we can buy fractionalized versions of all these things. Got it, got it. Um, it makes total sense as well. And you mentioned that you're now a lecturer in maths and physics. Um, can I ask what level? Is it like 100 level or 300 or master's level? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's introductory level and so the students I teach, uh, they're all either starting their engineering program. Most of the students are engineers. Some of them are in uh, computer science and software. Um, but yeah, most of them are planning on being engineers. And um, so I also teach, I teach a bridging program as well. So I teach students uh, that for whatever reason, either didn't make it out of high school or they need another credit to get into uni. Um, and so that's also part of, part of the program. Um, and so that's the, the calculus and the, the physics. Basically, uh, if you know your physics, I teach Newton's laws, so classical mechanics uh, at an introductory level. And I also teach electricity and magnetism. Um, and, uh, and then with the cryptocurrency stuff, that is, um, that is more uh, level 300 here in, in New Zealand. Um, uh, is, is that right? No, I've got that backwards. Uh, year three, level 700 here in New Zealand, uh, level seven and eight. Uh, so that's more of the older, more mature students. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I, I can kind of relate because I think, you know, back in the days I did electrical engineering and we had to do a course in mechanical, uh, like maybe a couple of, couple of classes. And I mean, I, I remember having to learn Bernoulli's equation and I had no idea what it meant. But you just had to sit there, you know, this is back in the, the late 90s, and absorb all this information the lecturer was throwing at you. And if you didn't understand it, I couldn't go to YouTube to, to hear it another way or be explained differently. I just right. had to read a textbook and, and practically failed the exam, really. But learning nowadays is totally different. Oh, I mean, it, the, the change is incredible. And it is entirely due to YouTube. I honestly believe that YouTube is the greatest, like, public good uh, of, of modern times, um, maybe even more so than, than Bitcoin, at least in the short term. Um, but I, I agree. So yeah, the same for me. When I was in school, uh, you were stuck with your lecturer or your prof. Uh, and if you were keen, you could go to the library um, or maybe make some friends that, that could help you out. Um, but nowadays, it's incredibly different. And uh, so you really have to incorporate uh, the YouTube uh, alternatives into into your planning uh, and sort of, we have to be careful not to teach with YouTube because that, that doesn't make you a good teacher, uh, but to encourage the students to, you know, uh, find a source. You know, a, lot of, a lot of learning is finding someone that you can relate to in, in conveying the, those concepts. And uh, so if you find a good YouTuber uh, that you 
can relate to and that you can understand really well, you know, that can be so much more valuable than having a lecturer. Um, and to try to do it in, in tandem. So yeah, YouTube is incredible. It's done crazy things. Most people in, uh, in crypto and blockchain and even a lot of computer science and software these days, they all learn on their own on YouTube. Um, and you know, the price of uh, an internet service provider is much, much more economical than the price of a uni degree. Uh, and so that's, that's really changed a lot. Yeah. And, and you also mentioned uh, Edward Snowden and, and Glenn Greenwell as well. And uh, his book, uh, I remember seeing a documentary where I think Glenn flew to Hong Kong and then they were like talking and uh, Edward Snowden had a sheet he covered over his head in order to type a password because he was that paranoid. Um, and d did you ever see um, Edward Snowden on the Joe Rogan podcast by any chance? Snowden on road. I have seen some of that. Yes, that I recall. Um, it was he was one of the first people to zoom in, right? Because he's in exactly. Russia. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that that documentary is yeah that documentary is excellent, and uh, I remember thinking the same thing. Like he's under the sheet typing in his password, but he was he was like he was buying himself time. I guess by the seconds or by the hours. Uh, you know, he was fully expecting to be found. Uh, and he was just waiting to make sure that uh, he could sort of tie up the loose ends according to his plan before it happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible story. And of course, now he's exiled. Um, he he is on Twitter and he occasionally makes video appearances. Um, and and I I would encourage uh, yourself or or anyone else uh, to read what he writes. He's uh, he's. Like you say, he's a he 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 can be seen as a bit extreme, but he's he's very well versed in things like privacy, uh, and in terms of how that relates to to human rights. And uh, uh, so I'm just fascinated by by the the whole story. And uh, just before our session today, I was I was thinking about it at, about how no one still knows how he got his information out of the NSA um, in the in the Hollywood version. He like puts a puts a USB stick into a Rubik's cube uh, and, and smuggles it out, and uh, he he never disclosed details of how he was able to get uh, because it's all closed networks, right? Uh, and you're you know nothing's allowed in or out, and uh, so I think that also was interesting. Um, he's now publicly disclosed on Twitter, you know, that he needed to use Bitcoin to pay for um, web hosting. Uh, in order to be able to set up the whole thing um, and, and so on. And so that really inspired me to check out, um, you know, this decentralized cryptocurrency. What, what, what does it all mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and indeed, his book as well, I think you mentioned, was it, um, was it Glenn's book you mentioned or his, uh, Edward's uh, or Snowden's book? Uh, I haven't read one by Snowden. Okay. Um, it was by Glenn Greenwald, the journalist. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, I, I just remember from the Joe Rogan show where uh, Snowden was just sharing his background, how he grew up in, in a family. His parents were like part of the government as well and, and all that. And then he was like seconded to Hawaii and he was just sitting there and then he just stumbled upon all this information. Amazing, as you say, fascinating story. Yeah, yeah, fascinating story. And of course, you know, he's, he, he's, cha he's changed that whole thing about how uh, governments collect data and what they do with it and uh you know uh whether or not they're allowed to in that whole legal process he really blew the lid off off of all of that yeah yeah and then what about your rabbit hole story i mean you alluded to this a little bit back in 2014 you saw the price of bitcoin but is it the first time you heard about it that was that was the first time that that i heard about it and uh but before that um you know i i sort of I like to say that all headlines lead to Bitcoin. Uh, and but before that, like well, well before that in 2008, uh, I was, uh, I, I remember this is obviously bef before Bitcoin, um, but the GFC was ongoing and it was making headlines worldwide. And it was, you know, uh, quite a big deal, especially uh, for, for people in North America, it dominated the news cycle. Uh, and uh, I didn't have any money, so I didn't, I didn't lose anything. Um, but my parents, in terms of things like pension funds and retirement accounts, 
and, and that boomer age, they definitely took a big hit. And at the time, I had no idea like what it all what it all meant. I had no idea how finance worked, none of that. And uh, so I started learning about that. Um, this is obviously preceding uh, the Bitcoin days. Uh, and so I already had a pretty strong interest in how financial markets work uh, and uh, basically how the money makes the world go round. Uh, and so when I saw Bitcoin, it didn't click at first, um, but I thought that's a cool idea. And actually there was a lot of China FUD um, around Chinese miners. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, no one really knows what's happening inside of China. Uh, you know, when I was trying to make my decision as to whether or not to, to get into and buy some Bitcoin. Um, and, and I ended up putting it on the shelf. Um, and I'm glad I came back to it, but of course wish that I came back earlier. So yeah, I, I think it all ties together like uh, uh, financial cycles, the occasional crises, which we may be, uh, we may be into now in the COVID era, um, and you know what, what's the way out? How can how can we try to protect ourselves? Um, how can we ensure that you know labor contributed to society today can uh, be rewarded and hold its value into the future for for our next generation, for our children? Um, you know, very important stuff. Thinking long term, and uh, so it all ties together. And uh, it, it wasn't until uh, it wasn't until Segwit. Uh, so the block size wars in 2017, that was when I first uh, bought some Bitcoin. I had to get a Coinbase account. And uh, I, I was basically, I still didn't really know much about it, but I was making a bet on, on the price going up after, uh, after the hard fork. And, uh, uh, but Coinbase had a limit. You could only buy, I think, $250 um, at a time. So I, I bought $250 uh, before the SegWit fork. Uh, and that led into the uh, 2017 bull run. Uh, and I was very green and I bought all the way up. <laughs> and then uh, I just had to, had to do a lot of learning all the way down. <laughs> I can, I remember those days very clearly. You're exactly right around the, um, the fork, which was around Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash. Is that right? With, um, uh, Craig right, Wright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I held all the way up and then held all the way down as well. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, when you got into crypto early on, you had to learn about finance and money. Yeah, similar with me as well, because learning the crypto journey, uh, you actually have to learn what is money. And I remember reading a book, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island. It's a big, thick book. It's apparently about how the uh, Federal Reserve was created back in, I think, the early 1900s. Uh, I, I know of it, yeah, but I haven't got to it. Yeah, it, it's a, a fascinating book. But what, what I wanted to touch on is that you mentioned that nowadays you're lecturing with uh, your maths and your physics, but you're also teaching Bitcoin, uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies, right? So you've yeah. managed to work this in as part of your career, which is very envious, and enviable because a lot of people they're in their day job and they hear about crypto and they're doing this at night time and they, they want to get into the crypto industry but how did you manage to to merge this technology into your career and your courses um yeah i mean a uh, uh, very very good question yeah you hear a lot of stories of this you know people leaving what they i guess uh deridely refer to as their day job uh, and, and making making the switch. Um, and so I, I still have sort of one foot in, in both, but I'm happy that I was able to. Um, what I did was I looked around the landscape at the universities here in New Zealand. And uh, I was looking I was looking for that Bitcoin class. There were a few already in, in America. Uh, this was in 2018. So a few years ago now. Um, so the the famous universities in America, they had some um, in their either computer science department. So every school has a has a computer science department. And uh, depending on how big your CS department is, you might also have a distributed systems group. Uh, and so that is an area of academic research, um, which has now been completely overtaken by blockchain. But uh, there's a bit of a lag uh, between the entrepreneurs and uh, and the cypherpunks and uh, 
and what happens at university. So I was having a look at these and seeing, well, what had other people done? And it turned out that no one in New Zealand had done anything. The only thing I could find was in, at the very end of one syllabus, I think it was literally the last word, uh, the prof had put in the word blockchain and it was in a cryptography class at University of Auckland. Um, and I thought, well, this is great. No one else is doing it. Uh, so this is, this is a perfect opportunity. Uh, and so I sort of uh, contacted, uh, got in touch with a colleague, the only other guy uh, that I was interested in blockchain. Uh, and together we, we built uh, some papers and got them, uh, got them approved. Uh, and so they're, still, so they're still going, which is good. Uh, and the last I checked, they're the only sort of blockchain specific um, classes that you can take uh, uh, at a uni in New Zealand. Um, and they're the, I guess maybe a plus and a minus is that they're elective courses. Um, so the, they're not part of any core, um, any core degree program, um, which means that uh, basically anyone from any background uh, if they have, you know, space and time, they, they can take the class. Uh, the, the downside is that you're dealing with a bunch, your audience is quite uh, varied in terms of their own backgrounds. So we do a bit of coding. We do a bit of uh, distributed systems, computer science stuff. The very first lecture is about the history of money. So we do a bit of economics as well. Um, we do sort of a lot of, a lot of blockchain conversation and it goes a little something like this. Uh, uh, I, I think a blockchain could help here. Uh, and then uh, myself or my colleague will say, okay, well, how is a blockchain going to help solve that problem? And that's kind of, uh, I guess, the, the trite version of what happens in a, in a blockchain paper. Um, if you look at other unis, uh, they do get into a lot more technical uh, systems work. Um, but at this stage for, for these classes that I teach, we, we don't do it an entire, we, we don't do a lot of that, but if students come in with quite a technical background, then for sure we encourage that. And we do get some students that sort of uh, write their own blockchains or um, piece together their own blockchains using, um, you know, contemporary tools. So I definitely got lucky in that sense that uh, we, I guess we came along at the right time. We weren't too early, we weren't too late, uh, and we got these uh, new classes approved. And so, yeah, moving forward, I'm uh, hoping to concentrate uh, entirely on that in terms of my 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 day job. Got it. So, um, with this courses, you mentioned it's elective. Uh, what's the duration? Is it like a semester or a, like a couple, a couple of hours a week over over a term? That's right. It's uh, one semester. Um, if it's an undergrad course, the students uh, generally get three hours a week. Uh, you can split that however you want. Most people will do a one hour lecture and a two hour tutorial where you go through some, some exercises or work on a project. And then at the master's level, uh, it's two hours a week. And again, that could be split into one hour of lecture and one hour of discussion. Uh, so it's only a couple hours a week um, in session time with the lecturer. Um, but the expectation is that outside of class, there's a lot more time as uh, as you know very well yeah um, i found the topic so fascinating that uh, as just like anyone else i quit my job and just studied full time because what happened was in crypto you learn you just learn so much because as you mentioned you learn you learn about money about economics you learn about programming about distributed systems you know ones and zeros um two to the power of 256 in you know, a public private case. It's just <laughs> the whole field is just a huge rabbit hole. And, and it's, just, oh, it's it, yeah. I like to say it's a, it's a perfect storm, right? It, it, and, and the storm components are computer science and mathematics and economics. Uh, and then th there's another one in there, which is sociology, right? It, and uh, the idea of incentivizing people to use a system such that you can say that it's fair or more fair than any other system we've known. And, and you know, how about incentivizing people not to behave badly? And uh, sure, you can try to attack the network, right? Bitcoin's the largest honeypot the world has ever known. And uh, you're welcome to try to attack the network, but it, it just, 
uh, it gets too expensive. Uh, and so people would rather play by the rules and, and earn some Bitcoin for themselves. I mean, it's, it's incredible the, uh, the I, guess it's, I guess it's game theory really between, uh, between the economics uh, and uh, sort of the, the hardware uh, and how, how people are uh, looking at the system. So yeah, there's so many different, um, so many different angles that, that you can take. And uh, difficult to be an expert in all of them. Um, <laughs> best maybe to pick one that you've already got some background in and uh, try to tackle that branch. Yeah, and, and more recently around uh, uh, regulation and, and government, which is another aspect which uh, in the early days everyone hated. If you're a, you know a, a libertarian and like unbank the banks, but nowadays I don't know if you heard, but CBA in Australia here are uh, adopting cryptocurrency and adding it to their app, uh, which was huge news uh, about a month ago. And CBA, is that, that's a bank? Yeah, Co Commonwealth Bank of Australia who owns oh, ASP. Oh, Commonwealth. Yeah, CBA. Uh, uh, I had, I guess I'd seen the headlines. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's crazy news, right? Totally. That, uh, and, and do they have, is there a, a senator, that might not be the right term, is there a senator there that is also backing this um, in terms of adoption in Australia? Yeah, I think there is. I can't remember the name, but um, yeah, but yeah, it, it's slowly making headways. But to have a bank come on board and provide cryptocurrency as part of their uh, banking app, I never thought I'd see that day happen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, talk about uh, coming into the wolf's den there, really, or the lion's den there, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, with with your um your background in you know maths and science etc., how did you find yourself? Because you, you're part of the blockchain exec council. How did you find yourself on there, and what do you do? Oh, that's right. So, I uh, a few years ago, um, so I've been following blockchain and Zed for a while, and a few years ago I had a startup, and so I was actually a member uh, as a startup a few years ago. Uh, the startup didn't really get off the ground uh, and, and go anywhere. Um, and so that membership lapsed. Uh, and then also in 2020, so a year ago, um, I got the notification that there were some open seats. And so I put up my hand for an education seat uh, at that time. Um, and then, uh, so that, that didn't work out. And actually that seat went to Alex Sims. Uh, I, I believe that was just last year. Um, and so, okay, and then, and then this year I got another uh, uh, notification, and uh, actually what happened was I, I asked to join the AGM, the general meeting, uh, and I was told that you had to be a member. Um, and I thought, I thought that our university was a member, uh, and so that sparked the whole conversation. So we now have the university joining as a member. This is just a few months ago, right? Um, and with that, there was an open seat. And so it, it all happened happened very quickly. Uh, Brian put, put my name forward for the seat, and so so I was in that seat as a, coming as a from an education institution. Um, but I think uh, officially I'm a, I'm in a corporate seat, um, which is fine. Um, what I what I hope to be able to bring to the council is is just that, which is my education background um, in terms of. Uh, bringing together a, a lot of different concepts uh, and having to find a way to teach a variety of different audiences um, and use the best, best path forward uh, to promote um, blockchain, promote Bitcoin, promote uh, all of the other good things that, that come along with it. Um, so that's, that's how I see it. And uh, I was looking at some of the uh, other chats that, that you've done. And, uh, Actually, the, the first two I looked at, both people put their hand up and said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for, for education as well. Uh, and so I was like, well, maybe I should, I should, I should contribute in a different area. Uh, but no, I don't think that's the, that's the right reason. And it, it doesn't hurt to have too many people uh, going down that pathway. Um, maybe as an aside, uh, I can perhaps be kind of like a technical pillar to lean on. Um, uh, in terms of published media and, and papers and articles, sometimes it can be difficult to get through some of the material and understand uh, what's happening. Uh, so perhaps I can, I can assist in that manner as well. I think I would 
consider myself maybe first a Bitcoiner and secondly, a technologist. Uh, so like you mentioned about uh, public private key pairs, I love that stuff. Uh, I don't shy away from what an elliptic curve is uh, and, and how it can be used uh, and, and perhaps uh, you know, the good parts and the bad parts uh, all the way down to the systems level. Uh, so I guess it's still early days, but uh, hopefully uh, I can contribute in a number of those areas. Sounds great. I mean, yeah, you, you, I remember the public-private key pair. It took me years to, to get my head around that. But luckily, I, I can see with your mathematics background, I mean, the, 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 the maths language, so to speak, you, you'd eat that up for breakfast, I imagine. Uh, maybe not for breakfast, but it uh, definitely makes a good <laughs> afternoon snack. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so what's on the horizon for you? I mean, uh, you know, so you, you're teaching crypto courses, you're lecturing. Um, do you have any side project, you know, something, anything that you can disclose? But I mean, what area interests you, for, for example? Um, so I guess uh, many, many things interest me. Um, uh, a, f a few things to note maybe are uh, proof of work and mining are something that I, I've been thinking more and more about lately, um, right? And so, uh, you know, proof of work is the, the underpinning of, of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency uh, and many other cryptocurrencies as, as well use proof of work. Currently, Ethereum is still a proof of work system. Um, and so this year, I think, as earlier this year, um, there was a tremendous amount of media attention given to uh, Bitcoin's energy consumption. Uh, and so I, I've been thinking uh, a lot about proof of work kind of from a, a very technical thermodynamic standpoint. Um, and, and I guess there's, there's one question, I've been following a few debates on Twitter, and the, there's one question is that can proof of stake, which is what Ethereum hopes to shift into um, perhaps next year, uh, can proof of stake be as secure as a proof of work system? Um, and uh, some people get very opinionated about this, but I, I don't think that the issue is settled just yet. We'll have to uh, maybe wait and see. Ethereum's the first major network. I would consider it decentralized uh, to shift into uh, a proof of stake setting. Um, so they really are the vanguard of, of that of that entire paradigm, which is, you know, can we remain decentralized? Can we remain secure? Can we incentivize actors in the right way? Uh, and can we do it without uh, having to manufacture ASICs? Um, and so I don't I don't have an opinion other than that I think it's an experiment and it's not settled. But I, I've been thinking about that uh, uh, both from the Ethereum and the Bitcoin side. Uh, uh, I think Bitcoin mining. Uh, itself has also made a lot of progress, even though it hasn't really technically shifted in any way, but that's probably a strength. Um, but uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, positives to, to Bitcoin mining that have really happened in, in the last year as well um, to, to strengthen proof, proof of work um, you know, as, a, as, a, as a viable and uh, valid system. Um, and another thing, that I, I do have a few ongoing projects on uh, around decentralized identity, um, or how can we uh, how can we leverage perhaps some benefits of a blockchain in order to assist people maintain control of their own identity in a digital manner? And so I have some ongoing projects uh, with that uh, right now, uh, and I feel like I'm just sort of learning the ins and outs of of what identity means, what digital identity means, um, what are some of the, the possible uh, solutions. I think we know a lot of the issues uh, ar around identity. Um, certainly with centralized identity, we know a lot of the issues and we've seen a lot of the damage that can do. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of hope that uh, identity in a centralized manner can really sort of return some of uh, some of the power back to the user um, uh, and really uh, the, the way it looks like it's going is that users are going to be able to keep a portion of their their digital footprint solely locked up on their device uh, and only reveal some of it as necessary wherever they go um, and 
so I think that I think that there's a lot of promise in in this area as well. Indeed, it sounds fascinating. I mean, there's so like like you say, there's so many avenues you could go down um, in your research. Um, I, I couldn't help notice uh, we started talking about the first artwork there with Satoshi in the background. Um, I just wanted to end with the other piece of artwork, which I believe is that Neil Armstrong on the moon. That one, yeah. Uh, that yeah, yeah. So, so that's a that's a a, a real NASA photograph, um, uh, and, and it's just that I think that it's from a late mission. There's a there's a rover in the background there, and so that is from Apollo 17, uh, one of the last missions to the moon. And uh, um, I just happened to pick that one up on on Trade Me, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a real NASA photograph either either from the moon or uh, from a Hollywood studio, depending on uh, on uh, what side of that debate you lie on. <laughs> Indeed, I mean, astronomy was my favorite uh, topic as a kid and I was devastated to learn that Pluto is no longer a planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a planetoid, yeah? So, so maybe uh, there, there's a few others that are in the category as Pluto as well, but they look like potatoes, right? Whereas Pluto actually looks like a planet. It's, it maintained its spherical structure it had the critical mass but uh it's it's mates are a bit misshapen yeah and then well uh you did point to another picture behind you which i that's not a a, a note is it i uh, uh, yeah i, I mean I, a keen eye will know what it is um you it's may not Mabway? know that, but i'm a i'm a trillionaire it's a it's a 100 trillion trillion dollar note yeah from uh from zimbabwe which is a yes. uh, uh in uh, I guess it's past tense now, a, a famous experiment in uh, monetary debasing. Yeah, I mean, I heard the story how people were, um, <clears throat> they had all these notes in a wheelbarrow, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, all these notes in a wheelbarrow just to buy a loaf of bread. I mean, I don't know if that was true or not, but uh, it's something I heard. I, I think it definitely is true. And uh, you see the same thing in Venezuela, right? Uh, they've had three debasements in about four years, I think. And uh, uh, so, I mean, absurd, uh, absurd stories, uh, kind of like wartime where people were using notes to, to burn them for the heat. Um, and uh, in terms of Zimbabwe, you know, Zimbabwe is a, a long way away. Um, I think it still has a value of maybe like $50 or something. The $100 trillion has an equivalent US dollar value of about, of about 50. Um, They'll give them to you if you go to Zimbabwe, but if you buy it on eBay, you have to pay a premium. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago watching Andreas Antonopoulos, one of his YouTube videos, and he was saying, or someone was saying that you'd go to a restaurant and you'd order something from the menu. And by the time you went to pay, the price would change <laughs> during your meal. Yeah, com completely absurd. And like from, from my standpoint or from our standpoint, you know, in a nice, uh, stable country and economy, uh, you know, the, these are the stories of, of fiction or of films, but it's incredible that, you know, many, many people in the world today, you know, live under sort of a, a modern hyperinflationary regime or context. Um, and, and, you know, it, it affects a lot of people. And, you know, that's one of the benefits of decentralization is that you, you can have a system that doesn't adhere to borders, and that's truly, truly global. One of the one of the first easy uh, rebuttals for people that say, "Well, Bitcoin is just you know digital payments, or 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 that's just a digital version of what we already have." Um, usually, uh, aside from these people maybe not having done a lot of a lot of homework, they're they're coming from a context of having like a nice stable system. They probably have a credit card. They probably have a mortgage, right? But uh, you know, something like Bitcoin is a truly decentralized, borderless system, and uh, I think that's often often overlooked in the debate um, in terms of the value that that it can bring. And if it doesn't bring you value, well, that's okay uh, because it quite possibly could help somebody else. Um, nowadays, it might be a little bit expensive uh, in terms of fees uh, for some of the some of the you know unbanked or some of the poor countries in the world to to buy bitcoin but there are solutions to that that are that are coming around around as well you mentioned antonopoulos there he he uh, 
he he's kind of uh, faded a little bit recently working on his own personal projects. But one of his YouTube interviews was very pivotal pivotal for me as well. Uh, I remember him talking about uh, talking about the situation in Greece, which is where he's from, uh, and how they were undergoing uh, uh, a lot of inflation. This was, uh, I think, as they were trying to join the EU so that, you know, they could have uh, the euro as their uh, monetary currency. Uh, and, you know, it, it really hit Andreas hard because he was telling the story, you know, about his mother's life savings that she has in a Greek bank account and how, you know, it was really important for him to be able to convince her to convert her life savings uh, into Bitcoin. And uh, so that you know, really was an influential moment for me watching Andreas tell that story. Uh, and of course, you know, he's, a, he's an OG. His book, Mastering Bitcoin, uh, is, is one, of, one of the best technical descriptors of Bitcoin and the software around. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. I think anyone who wants to get into Bitcoin, including myself, have watched hundreds of hours of Andreas on YouTube. So, um, so thank you so much for your time, Jeff. It's been amazing talking to you and learning a bit more about your background. Uh, love the three pieces of artwork you've got in the background as well. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Cheers, Sean. It's been great. Awesome. I'll catch you later. Bye.